Uh, let's actually, let's just stand and pray before we get into God's word. Lord Jesus, we come before you. I come before you and we understand that unless you speak to our hearts, God, everything that will be said will be in vain. And I pray, speak to all of us. Let your word shine light into our hearts, God. May we see you for who you are and that we catch another glimpse of you and love you more as a result of all of this that we read and study in your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stay standing. Let's read the passage for today. It's from Philippians chapter 4, beginning with the second half of verse 5, and we're going to read up to verse 7. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. You know, I, uh, as I was preparing for this message, I prepared a Mark Twain, another Mark Twain quote for you. I'm like, why am I, why am I, why is this the second week that I'm quoting Mark Twain? I'm not reading anything from Mark Twain. It just, I don't know why it just happened. So here you're going to get another Mark Twain quote, hopefully not anymore for a while, but I think you'll enjoy this one with his usual kind of wit and his humor. He said, I've experienced many horrible things in my life a few of which have actually happened, right? The, the, he, he captures anxiety perfectly, does he not? Right? We, we go through all these horrible things, being anxious and, and worried and imagining all these different scenarios, and then so often they never actually happen, right? But we've lived through them as if they actually have happened, You know, anxiety, they say anxiety is the most common mental disorder globally. I think all of us, right, have experienced anxiety, you know, from one degree to another, whether it's financial or it's health-related or you're worried about your kids or you're worried about getting married and your family life, your career, your future, or tomorrow's big test, right? Whatever it is, we've all experienced anxiety worry and anxiety. And here's my main point. I'm going to give you the main point, the application of today's text right away so you don't miss it. In order for us to experience God's peace, we need to have the right perspective and we need to pray. Let me say that again. In order for us to experience God's peace, we need to have the right perspective and we need to Pray, And I'm going to have a little bit of sub-points under those, but that's the main point here. So let's look at the first part, the right perspective. Look with me. Have your Bibles, please, open to Philippians chapter 4, and we'll look at second half of verse 5 and then 6. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. If we want to have God's peace, if, if, if the first step is to not be anxious, and the Greek literally says, don't be anxious about nothing, right? Now, we don't use double negatives in English, right? Because then that means it's the opposite. But Greek will actually use double negatives as a way of building emphasis, right? Russian does this oftentimes, right? Says, don't be anxious about nothing at all, right? That's what he's saying. And I want to ask you this, though. This phrase by itself have you ever had that moment where you're just worried about something and then somebody comes up to you and just kind of like slaps you on the back? Hey, don't worry about it, buddy. It's going to be fine. Everything's going to be okay. And that's all they tell you. How do you feel in that moment, right? It's just irritated, maybe angry at that person because, because they, they, they just they don't understand the gravity of that situation, and, and all they're just saying is, ah, I'll be fine. In fact, usually that just makes us even more anxious, right? It just reminds you about how bad it is, and now you need to deal with this person that you're angry at. You see, just by saying, do not be anxious in itself, 
makes things worse. It's important to understand the reason behind why we should not be anxious, and God actually provides us a reason why you and I should not be anxious about the things in our life. And that reason is the end of verse 5, the Lord is at hand, or in other words, the Lord is near. So the first lesson today from God's Word is that if we want to experience God's peace, we need to zoom out. We need to change our perspective. We need to remember that Jesus is near, meaning, meaning he is close. He knows in full detail, microscopic detail, all the problems of my life. He is near to me always, right? We believe that. We believe in the omniscience of God, that he knows all things. So he knows everything. He is near. He is close. He is closer to me than my own heart is to me, right? And closer to you than your own skin is to you. He is near in that way. But we also understand that he's near in the sense that he is returning soon. Revelation 22, verse 20, the very end of the Bible, very last chapter, Jesus there says, surely I am coming soon. And I know there's some of you, you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, where has he been for the last 2,000 years? Is he really coming soon? It's been 2,000 years. Where is he? And I just want to remind all of us that God desires for all of us to live in anticipation of his return. You think that God did not know that he would not come for at least 2,000 years when he said, I am coming soon? You think God is sitting up there in heaven kind of scratching his head like, well, I, uh, I wish I didn't say I was coming very soon because I kind of misled them. It's been 2,000 years, right? Oh, well, you order your pizza, and I know I told you it'd be here in a minute, but it's been six hours, and it's cold, but I hope you enjoy it, right? You think God is in that position right now? He's not. He knows exactly what he was doing because the whole Bible, the reason of emphasizing that Jesus is coming back soon is for us as Christians to live in anticipation of him. Every generation ought to live in anticipation of the second coming of Christ. And friends, Jesus is still truthful. He's still truthful because in the perspective of eternity, whether it takes Jesus to come back two years 200 years, 2,000, or 20,000 years in the perspective of eternity is all like the blink of an eye. I asked my 90-year-old grandma, I said, Grandma, how long did your life feel? You've lived for 90 years. You've lived, you know, you were alive before World War II. You, you've, you've lived through all of that. How long does your life feel? And she, you know what she said? Like a blink of an eye. Just a blink of an eye, and I'm here, and that's it, and it's over, and she's already with the Lord. Time will pass, and we need to live in anticipation of his return. In fact, Jesus gives us five different parables throughout the Gospels about his return, and that he is coming, and that it will be sudden, and it will be a surprise. Jesus desires for all of us, if you call yourself a Christian today, Jesus wants us to live to, to, to hope for his return, to expect it, to desire it, to seek it. And you know what John, Apostle John's response was when we, he, he heard Jesus say at the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22, 20, when Jesus said, surely I am coming soon, you know what his response was? Amen, come Lord Jesus. And that ought to be the cry of all of our hearts. When we remember that he is coming soon, we say, amen, come, Lord Jesus, come. Friends, Jesus will come soon. I'm here to assure you that from God's word. These are not my words. These are the words of God. And he will come in the fullness of the glory of God in power. And every eye will see him and every knee will bow before the king of heaven and earth. And he will put an end to the course of this world. He's going to stop the development of history dead in its tracks. And then all of us, every single soul that has ever existed, will realize and see 
that he always was and is and will be the center of all things. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he promises that he will wipe away every tear. He will right every single wrong. And so the point here of this message is that so often, you and I, we live in anxiety. Anxiety that doesn't allow us to breathe. Anxiety that we feel in our guts, right? Because we don't think about the end. Not the end of my life, but the end of all things. Our head is spinning with all the different things going on around us. All the problems popping up, all the different things going wrong. All the ways that we are failing. And we forget about the climax that all of history is building up to. That is the arrival of the Son of God. We slip into this thinking of like, Life is just this endless cycle, right? It's this endless cycle that just keeps flowing. It's like the water cycle, right? Water comes down, it, you know, it streams into the oceans, it evaporates, it comes down. We, we think that's how all of life and history is, and, and I'm in this crazy, vicious cycle, and things are going to be bad for me in this cycle. It's like being stuck you know, in a dryer, right? Not fun. Imagine going to, if we can go to the next slide, imagine going to the theater with your friends. And let's just say you didn't know what the movie was about, right? And you just went because your friends are going, you trust them, you never heard of this movie. And you go in and you sit there and you start watching the movie and all it's calm and calm and all of a sudden you're just like, man, this is, a, this is not a pleasant movie. I'm like, you're worried, right? You're sitting on the edge of your seats, you've already bit all your nails, you're, you're eating the popcorn faster and faster, right? Your heart is racing. It's just like really anxiety producing. And then, all of a sudden, you remember on your way, as you're walking to the theater, as the people are walking out, you remember a conversation you heard kind of in the, in the background. Someone said, ooh, I'm glad they all survived, right? And all of a sudden, it's like remembering, like, oh, wait, that was, he was talking about this movie. It was, you, you remember the spoiler, and you're like, I have nothing to worry about. They all survive. It's fine. It's okay. It's going to be okay. You see, remembering about the return of Christ and how he will reorient everything in this world around himself, and he will take care of his own, is like, it's like remembering that spoiler in this movie that's unpleasant, that you're worried about. And remember, you know what? It's going to be fine. Like one preacher says it, I love it. He said, I've read the end of the book. We win. Everything will be fine. Amen? We win. Because Christ wins, and we are Christ's. So, the more, here's the application from this point. The more clearly and the more often that we think about how near Jesus is, the more peace we will have. Say that again. The more clearly and the more often that we actually think about how near Jesus is, the more peace we will have. I want you to think about the things that you are worried about right now. Just make a quick mental list. Let's start with a test. Will these things matter from one year from now? If not, right, they're not worth worrying about. If yes, will they matter 10 years from now? If not, don't worry about it. If yes, if they still will matter 10 years from now, will they matter on your deathbed? Will they matter in eternity when you are with Jesus forever and ever and ever? Probably not, right? They won't. And here's the question. Do you actually think about the return of Christ in light of your anxieties? Or have you ever thought about the return of Jesus in light of your anxieties and the things that keep you up at night? Do the rays of his return, do they shark sh shine on the dark grip that the anxieties have on you? 
Or are those two things in completely separate boxes on the other side of the house for you, right? Is the return of Christ for you like your Christmas decorations that you have kind of somewhere high up in the garage that you pull out once a year? That's it. It's not meant to be in that box. It is meant to shine its light on our daily anxieties every single day. The Word of God comforts us. The Lord is near. So that's the first part. God gives us the, the negative, right? Do not do this. Do not be anxious because the Lord is near. But then he gives us the positive instead, the, the, the flip side of the coin, right? Verse 6, read with me. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So instead of being anxious, we ought to pray. And in everything, we ought to make our requests known to God. So, and I love the contrast here in, in God's word. Nothing is what we should be worried about, and everything is what we should be praying about, right? And here's the key. Being worried about something is not at all the same thing as actually praying about it. I know that seems obvious, but maybe, maybe we treat our thoughts as if they're prayers. You know, well, I, I'm thinking about it a lot, I'm worrying about it a lot, and God knows all my thoughts, right? So that kind of counts like prayer? No, that, that doesn't. It, the Word of God, yes, God knows all of our thoughts, and yet God still commands us to make our requests known to Him. That's just what we're commanded to do. It's not enough to just worry about things. That's not at all what the Bible tells us to do. The Bible says make that request known to him. Praying is not just thinking. We can, we can pray in the form of thinking, but all thinking is not prayer. So when we are anxious, it's important to realize there's always something that we're anxious about, right? Right? And, and if it gets so bad, maybe we're just anxious and we don't even know what we're anxious about because our mind is racing so much. All of those things, whatever they are, just keep bringing them back to God. Make your requests known to God in everything. And even if you don't have a, any one particular thing, just make that the prayer. Lord, I don't even know what I'm anxious about. I'm just anxious. I've had times like that in my life. I'd be sitting at church and I'd just... And I just feel like everything inside of me is just crushing itself. I don't even know how to explain it. But it's just, just very deep anxiety. And just, Lord, I don't even know what it is, but help me. It doesn't matter how small or how big. Everything is what we ought to bring to God. And isn't it a joy knowing that no prayer is too small or too silly for God? None of it. None of it is too small. Isn't it a joy knowing that he desires for us to pour our hearts out to him, even in the, in the minutia of life? So anytime you're worried, turn that worry into a prayer. And even if you end up praying about the same exact thing 137 times a day, even better, even better. God delights in that. So we're, we're told to make everything known to him through prayer and supplication. But then there's also this very important point. It says, with thanksgiving, verse 6 says, with thanksgiving. And this is amazing because neurologists and psychologists are just now starting to confirm this with studies. But they're finding that when we are thankful, we are less anxious. That's just how we operate, right? I mean, you know, one guy was saying, your brain cannot easily focus on both positive and negative stimuli. There's multiple studies that have shown that gratitude reduces anxiety. And it's amazing because the science is confirming what God already gave to his people almost 2,000 years ago. Be thankful to God. God knew the way he designed us, right? We are single-hearted creatures in many ways, are we not? We can only worship one God. We can only be truly in love with one person, right? 
That's just how we work. We can only be at one place at one time. Our attention can truly be focused on one thing. I know we multitask, but it's not multitasking. Uh, we know it's just multi-distracting, right? So he commands us, instead of living in anxiety, let your heart be filled with gratitude, leaving no room for worry. And so as you pray, thank him. Thank him for the smallest of blessings. Thank him for every meal. Thank him for every moment you don't feel sick, for every person in your life, for every moment of being alive, for knowing him, for having peace with him, with, for being his child, for being under his care, for having peace with him, for knowing that you have a future with God forever and ever, and the millions of other blessings that he showers upon us every single day. Take a deep breath right now. Felt good, huh? My grandma, when she got the West Nile virus, she was paralyzed for five months. She couldn't breathe on her own. She needed a machine to force air into her lungs. Every breath, friends, is a gift from God. You can at least be thankful for that in your anxieties. And believe me, my grandma still had things to be thankful for as we spoke to her as she was on the vent. And you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be thankful when everything's going great, right? When the sun is shining down upon me, I just got a raise at work, right? I mean, it's easy to be thankful. But as soon as we stub our toe, right? All of that thankfulness just evaporates. And it's easy to make excuses to not be thankful when even a little bit of things are going wrong. But it's interesting because God's Word is telling us that when we are most worried, when things are going wrong the most, that is when we need to give thanks the most. Notice God's word doesn't say, and after God has answered all your prayers and all the things you've been worried about have been dealt with, then respond with thankfulness. That's not what it says. It's not first this, then that. It's instead of this, do that right away, right? When things are hard, when you are worried, sick, when you're anxious, then pray and in your prayers, give thanks. It's ironic. When we need it most, we do it least. Let me ask you this. Let's say, God forbid, you're driving home from church and you get into an accident and you lose your arm, right? The, your non, let's say non-dominant arm. I don't know about you, but I would have a hard time being thankful to God, right? I lost my arm. What if you lost both of your arms? What if you lost all of your limbs, would thankfulness be a word that would describe us and who we are? I want us to go to the next slide. Nick Wojcic, he was born without any arms, without legs. <laughs> That's who he is his entire life. And he struggled, he, he describes his struggle with anxiety. I mean, just imagine the anxiety that you feel being there. You know, he, he was saying, I'm never going to get a job. I'm never going to have a family. I'm never going to have a wife. What kind, how, what kind of husband could I be if I can't even hold my wife's hand? He can do none of those things. There's no life purpose. There is nothing, right? Just imagine being in his situation. You can't walk, you can't drive, you can't type, you can't dress yourself, you can't feed yourself, and you really got to ask in that moment, is life truly worth living? If there's one guy that has the right to make excuses, to not be thankful, it's Nick. And yet, when you watch his videos, you see a man who is more positive than all of us here, right? 
He's always telling the world about Jesus. He's traveling the world, speaking to millions. He has a wife. He's got four kids. You think, like, talk about just, he's always talking about gratitude. He's always talking about thankfulness to God. Just look at the things that he says. He says, there were times when I sort of looked at my life and kept thinking, well, I can't do this and I I can't do that. And he says, if you keep on concentrating on the things you wish you had or the things you wish you didn't have, you end up forgetting what you do have. You see, in Nick, we see a man who is not weighed down with anxieties. We see a man who is trusting in God. We see a man who is grateful, who's thanking God, and God gives him joy. And God is using him and his circumstances to inspire millions of people and to spread the gospel all over the world. That's amazing. So I want you to make a mental list. I want you to, this is the application. I want you to make a mental list of the things you're worried about. And now instead of just worrying about them nonstop, turn those thoughts into prayers to God and saturate your prayer with thanksgiving. Let your prayer be heavy with thankfulness to God. If Nick Vujicic can be thankful we can be thankful. Amen? <laughs> so, recapping. When we remember that Jesus is coming back, we have the right perspective. We can go to the next slide. And when we pray with thankfulness, something amazing happens. We get the peace of God. And this is the, the math here in God's word. Perspective plus prayer equals peace. And let's read with me with verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God promises to send us his peace, one that is beyond our understanding, one that that we cannot even fully grasp. and, And this is not just some kind of psychological tricks and tips, right? Like take a breath and then another breath and hold for 10 seconds and then exhale through your mouth. That's not what this is talking about. This goes beyond the physical and into the supernatural. God promises us a peace that makes no rational sense. In, in Meaning, things in your life could actually not become better. In fact, your circumstances could get worse And yet you will still have the peace of God. For those who trust God, right? And and trusting God, what's at the heart of that? It's thankful prayer, right? God gives peace. Isaiah 26 verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. If we're bringing everything to God, every single worry, our mind will be stayed on God. Psalm 112, verse 7, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Those who trust God, God gives them peace. And again, to the mind, it might make no sense. There's no promise that things will get better, but God's peace enters in. You know, it reminds me, 10 years ago, when I was appointed to be the leader of Bright Youth, I knew I had big shoes to fill. And I knew that I wasn't as good a good leader as the previous guy. He had more experience than me. And, and when I had to take over the youth, man, that, that, it was just this crushing burden, right? It was the biggest responsibility ever. It, it, for months, it felt like as if, you know, you imagine you're, you're taking a hike through the forest and then this 500-pound rock just falls on you and it's on your chest and you could just barely breathe, right? That, that's how I felt for months, just so insecure, just crushed by the idea of completely failing everything that was entrusted to me. I knew that I would be a certain failure and it did not feel good. And you know the only thing that got me out of that place? Trusting God. 
only after spending weeks of prayer, 5 a.m., just waking up and just pacing around in my living room, just crying out to God, saying, Lord, help me, after I surrendered all of it to him. It was only after I told him, Lord, if you want me to be a failure, then help me fail being as faithful as possible to you. If that's what you want from me, if that's my purpose in your kingdom, is to fail, to sink this ship, (laughs) help me be as faithful as possible to you in all that I do. Only after I had trusted God with my own insecurity, my own self-image, my own future, only when I remembered about the eternity where the only thing that will matter between me and God for all of eternity is whether I was faithful to Him, right? Only when I had that right perspective did that rock lift and I was able to finally take a deep breath and breathe and live. The peace of God came upon me. And you know what? It was that peace of God that surpasses all understanding because there was nothing in my physical world that changed. I didn't have a vision at night that I, you know, I was going to do a great job and all this success. I didn't have any of that, right? I was, I was certain of failure as ever. I didn't wake up in the morning and, and develop all these leadership skills overnight that said, oh, you're going you're gonna to do well. No, none of that. I just said, God, I want to be faithful even if that means being a failure. And God gave me this peace. And I love what it says. It says, we'll guard your hearts and your minds. So your heart and your mind. So meaning the the peace of God guards our whole inner person. Not just a part of us, but our whole inner person. And this word guard. I love this word guard. Isn't it amazing how wise God's word is? Think about this. Anxiety. Why are we anxious? Why, Why do we become anxious? I think it's because it's when we think about the future and we think that something bad is going to happen in the future. And then it's not just that, right? It's also thinking that, okay, well, if I think about it enough, if I think of it from through, through all the different ways where I, where I rewind this scenario and I think about it in all the different ways, I can prepare and I can somehow protect myself from this bad thing that I'm afraid of happening, Right? That's what anxiety is. And we start to obsess about this bad thing. And, and, we, and we think we're protecting ourselves. We think we're guarding ourselves by anticipating this bad thing happening. But in reality, the cure becomes worse than the disease, right? We actually begin to hurt our own selves with our own protection. It's not silly. We destroy our own selves with the things that ought to help us. And God's word says, no, no, my peace will guard you. Not your own thoughts, not your own plans, not your own devices. My peace will guard you and it will guard all of you. I will protect you from your own quote unquote protection. That's how needy we are. We need to be protected from our own protection. And when we pray, instead of obsessing nonstop, when we remember that Jesus is coming soon, that he will make all things right, when we give thanks to God as we worry about things, we will have a peace that makes no sense, a peace that cannot be explained by this world, a peace from God himself. As I call the band up, I want to finish with one last very crucial part of this verse. Notice at the very end of verse 7, it says, we'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, it's easy to kind of skip over that because we think, well, it's the Bible. Like, they kind of had to use the word Jesus at least every couple of sentences, right? And it it feels like it's just being sprinkled in. Not at all. That's not what's going on here. The peace that protects us is in Christ Jesus. We can't miss this very critical part. And that's the whole point of the gospel, friends. The reason that Jesus came into this world 
is to pay for my sins, to pay for your sins, right? That's why he came, to forgive us. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace with God is found only through Jesus Christ. And this is literally the best news that anyone could ever tell you. Better than getting a raise, better than meeting the girl you're gonna marry and be happily ever after for the rest of your life, this is the greatest news ever, that you have peace with God. He has made that peace. Doesn't it feel bad when, when someone has something against you? Right, like when you know someone has something against you, and it might not even be your fault. I was recently talking to somebody. He's like, man, this guy, he's, he's really upset with me. And I, I, didn't, I don't think I did anything wrong, but he's just so upset. And it just doesn't feel good, right? You don't feel that peace. What if you actually did do something wrong, right? If, then it feels 10 times worse. What if that person is someone important to you, right? Like some, a family member or, or your boss, right? It just doesn't feel right. Here's the reality, friends. Because of our sin, we have problems with God. Because of our sin, we don't have peace with God. That's our natural state. He's not happy with us. And there is nothing we can do to undo the damage that we have done but God. But God. Not wanting to destroy us. Not wanting us to perish sent his only beloved son into this world to take on all of the punishment, to justify us by faith, and now we have peace with God. Friends, in Christ, God has solved our greatest problem. My eternity is secure with God, and I know where I'm going to be when this body dies and I'm going to be there for a really, really long time, and it's going to be a really, really good time. I have that. And in comparison to everything else, I don't have problems. I don't have problems. None of us have problems. But if you haven't trusted in Christ, you also don't have problems in comparison to this problem. This is the greatest problem having to stand and face the wrath of God all on your own. We can't do it. Christ is the only way. So trust in him, and he will save you because he delights to save, to give eternal life. And in Christ, we are safe, we are secure, we are loved, we're forgiven, and he is coming back soon to take us back to the place that he said he would prepare for us so let us pray with thanksgiving, and we will have this peace. Amen? Let's pray. I'm going to give you a minute of response time, and I'll close. Lord Jesus, we thank you with hearts full of joy, God, that you have saved us, and we thank you. I pray that we would just love you, wait your return, Remember that you are near. Thank you and pray to you in all things, God. You're so gracious. Thank you for revealing the end to us, that we win with you, Jesus, and everything's going to be okay. We thank you. We worship you. We pray this all in your name. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Alpha and Omega. Amen.